Namaste. So today's sutra is from the Chula Vedala Sutta, the lesser sutra of questions and answers. And there are many questions and answers on all kinds of interesting things. But I want to focus in on two of them having to do with sankhara or fabrications. Now, lady, what are fabrications, sankhara? These three fabrications, friend Vishaka, bodily fabrications, verbal fabrications, and mental fabrications. But what are bodily fabrications? What are verbal fabrications? What are mental fabrications? In and out breaths are bodily fabrications. Directed thought and evaluation are verbal fabrications. Perceptions and feelings are mental fabrications. Very nice questions and answers. What's going on here is that uh, Visaka is the husband of this lady who became a nun, a Buddhist nun and became renowned as a great teacher in the Buddha's Sangha. So <laughs> on the pretext of asking her questions, he's uh, sitting and visiting with her and enjoying her company. But still, the dialogue is so nice that it was preserved as a sutra by the assembly of monks, the uh, arhants, after the Buddha passed away. So, what are fabrications? Well, a fabrication is something that's made, constructed, built up, something that isn't natural. It's artificial. It's designed. It's a product of will, desire, and intention. So there are three types of fabrications, bodily fabrications, verbal fabrications, and mental fabrications. Breathing in and out are bodily fabrications. Why? Because that's what sustains the body. If you stop breathing, you know, it's pretty much the end. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're in deep meditation. That's something we'll talk about another time. Then verbal fabrications are directed thought and evaluation. And why is that? Because after considering something and directing one's thoughts toward it, evaluating it, and understanding it, one usually breaks out in speech. And so the uh, causes or the fabrications behind speech, verbal fabrications, are these directed thoughts and evaluations. And similarly, perceptions and feelings are mental fabrications. The mind is based on perceptions and feeling. Without those, there is no such thing as a mind. So we have thoughts about perceptions, thoughts about feelings, and that is what makes up our mind. Without those, the mind doesn't exist. So this is very interesting because we want to uh, reduce, as far as possible, the activity of the mind. The mind is what keeps us bound in samsara. So the mind always has an opinion huh, about everything, every perception, every feeling, every experience that we take in through the senses. The mind has some opinion, some thoughts about it, some fabrication. 
And of course, the principal fabrication is the root sequence, the mula pariyaya. So we've been over the mula pariyaya sutta in the very beginning of this channel. But it's worth repeating again that this basically involves injecting the conceit of I and mine into our direct experience. And this becomes such a habit that it's called reflexive experience. It's just a reflex. Huh? As soon as you get any kind of a sense impression, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch, or even in the mind. One has to inject or project the conceit, huh? the imaginary ego-boosting thought, I, <laughs> and mine, into it. And this is such a habit, it's just automatic. But it takes up a lot of energy. And this is why people who don't meditate are not very brilliant, you know. Their minds are full of all this cruft of I and mine projected and attached to their thoughts and feelings. So to undo this, one simply has to see it as it is. And it's so embarrassing. <laughs> if, you, if you see what you're doing, you can't do it anymore. Uh, it's like somebody who has really bad dandruff or something like that. You know, they don't know that they have it. But if somebody else points it out, hey, dude, you have really bad dandruff. And then they realize, oh, my God, I do. After that, they have to do something about it. Uh, it's so embarrassing. So they have to take care of it. And it's the same way with the habitual operations of the mind. These are all sankara. These are all fabrications. These are all things that we add to our experience to construct the ego. Now, the way the ego is built <laughs> is very tricky. There is no such thing as I, a separate individual. So what the mind does, it takes every perception that comes in through the senses of the body and stamps them mine. So this is mine, and that is mine, and the other thing is mine, and those are mine, and so on. So if all this stuff is mine, then I must exist, right? You see? <laughs> it's a magician's hat trick. I doesn't really exist. But if all this stuff is mine, then I must exist. See? So the mind is predicating the existence of I on the existence of mine which is something that it creates by fabricating it. Sankara. So you see the danger of Sankara? We create a whole illusory world of I and mine out of it. Oh, but that's not the punchline yet. Huh? The punchline comes in the next sutra. Now again, lady, what is the Noble Eightfold Path? This is the Noble Eightfold Path, friend Visaka. Right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Is the Noble Eightfold Path fabricated or unfabricated? The Noble Eightfold Path is fabricated. This is a big deal. Most so-called Buddhists don't realize this. They think the Noble Eightfold Path is something natural and immutable. 
but actually it was fabricated by the Buddha. And the proof of that is there are eight steps and four of them refer to the body and four of them refer to the mind. And since the mind and the body are both fabricated, then these steps must also be fabricated because they refer to fabricated entities. See, the stages of right view, right resolve, right mindfulness and right concentration address the mind. And the stages of right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort address the body. So therefore, the Noble Eightfold Path must be fabricated. Well, there's another sutta where the Buddha admits that even the jhanas are fabricated. Maybe we'll do that one tomorrow. <laughs> the point is that the path has to be fabricated. Why? Because its purpose is to remove these fabricated things, the body and the mind. So to work with a fabricated object, the tool must also be of the same nature. I mean, if we could just drop the body and mind, we could immediately assume our real nature. But the fact is, because of our attachment to them, we can't. We can't just drop them. So we need a method by which we gradually disentangle ourselves from the attachments to the body and the mind. And these are the Eightfold Path and the Eight Jhanas. And we'll, we'll get into the Jhanas at another time. Um, I mean, we've already been over them in the past series, but we should take another look at them now. So this is the thing about fabrications. Fabrications exist because of our lust, our desire for things and our desire against things, things that we want and things that we don't want, plus our delusion that we are an individual. So because of this delusion, then we think these fabrications are justified. In fact, we think they're normal. So, okay, if we want to get rid of these fabrications, then we use another fabrication, just as if we have a thorn stuck in our hand or foot. We can take another thorn and dig it out, isn't it? So this is the Eightfold Path. And these are the fabrications that we want to get rid of by means of the Eightfold Path and the jhanas. So once one reaches the perfection or the result of this Eightfold Path, then they can give up both the uh, fabricated body and mind and the tools by which one can overcome them. And then one is completely free from all fabrications and resumes one's original nature. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.